This is my PDP 1144, and it's a pretty cool computer if you can call it a computer. Uh, right now it's kind of just a CPU. And <laughs> like, we're, like we're having a rough go of it when it comes to storage. Uh, we wanna make this thing like super cool by bolting up an FPS 100 and an FPS 3000. Uh, this will give it something like 28 mega flops of performance, which is ludicrous in the early 1980s, making this a super mini computer. But uh, computers, the key word there, every computer has to have storage of some kind and we keep striking out on that front. In the previous episode, we did get a TU-58 tape drive hooked up to it, but uh, we haven't been able to read anything off of the TU-58 tapes because none of them contain any PDP-11 information on them. And we found a utility to do that, and that's probably what I should be doing today, but uh, man, like the hard drive, so I'm losing sleep about our hard drive situation on this machine. We have a couple of problems. Initially, I thought we would use a Fujitsu Eagle, uh, but I can't find a controller card for that, and ultimately really ends up that we don't have enough space. We've only got this tiny little 3U section here to fit both the TU-58 tape drive and a hard drive. I do have an, two RA-70s and an RA-72. I even bought a spare board set for one of the RA-70s. All of that is bad. None of that works. <laughs> all of those drives, all the board sets, they're all broken. There are no schematics, so it's incredibly difficult to figure out how they're broken and how we can troubleshoot them. And really, honestly, I would like to fit the biggest hard drive I can fit into this machine. And so I have a couple of eight inch Finch drives, but there are no controller cards for the Finch drive for this. But my buddy Coley is uh, coming through in a absolute clutch move and he sent me this big thing. This is a Fujitsu 2312, I think. It says Memorex 214 on the front of it, but it was kind of an OEM thing from Fujitsu. Uh, it is unhealthy, but we have the documentation for it. So the goal today is to get this up and running. Uh, it's kind of a lofty goal. The goal today is to figure out what's wrong with it and maybe start to hunt down why why it's bad i don't i don't know it's really heavy let's get started that opening was a bit of a, a discombobulated mess but in my defense i am also a bit of a discombobulated mess right now because i decided to make the switch from windows 10 to linux on my daily driver editing rig inside and uh it, it it's been two days of full-on struggle bus like <laughs> It did not go smoothly at all. <laughs> Linux mostly works out of the box, but the second that you need to do something slightly out of the ordinary, it just all goes sideways and you're in the console doing all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, and But the biggest problem was DaVinci Resolve. Getting DaVinci Resolve to play nice with an AMD graphics card is a serious challenge. It required a lot of effort to overcome. I think I've got it, but there's still lots of weird quirks and it doesn't seem to be running as smooth as it should be, which is all to say that like my tool chain, my video editing tool chain and video production tool chain is all broken right now. So I have no idea how this video is gonna turn out. It may sound terrible, it may look terrible. Uh, it's gonna take probably about a month for me to, <laughs> to get my legs back underneath me and figure out a new tool chain within the Linux environment that works for video production. So just bear with me for a little bit here. But uh, I'm gonna take a step away from that for a moment and uh, step onto a completely different struggle bus, which is a hard drive on the PDP-1144. And we're gonna do that with this Memorex uh, 214 here. This is really just a Fujitsu 2312. It's an 84 megabyte, eight inch uh, SMD hard drive. My buddy Coley sent this down. Thank you so much, Coley, you're an absolute legend. Uh, but we can't just plug this in, this thing in and go because uh, Coley says that it's unhealthy. Um, thankfully though, there is a collection of status LEDs on the front here. So on the bench, we can power it up. If it doesn't go ready, we should have a fault code on those LEDs, which we can then look up in the 400 page manual for this hard drive that has the full theory of operation and a full set of schematics. So if there is an electronics fault and the heads and mechanically it's all fine, which we think it is, uh, we have a hope of getting this thing up and running. But the first step is gonna be getting some power into it, spinning it up and seeing what the fault code is. And that's gonna take also a little bit of effort because it doesn't have like a standard 
plug on the black back. So we gotta cobble together some kind of power supply on it. The real first step though is removing this cooling fan on the back. We'll definitely need it later, but it's gonna make the drive just a little too big, I'm afraid. It's held in place with four screws and then it pulls straight off. Next, let's get the top plate of the drive off. It's held in place with just two screws. With those removed, it comes right off, giving us a great look at all of the dip goodness. This thing is brilliant. Just brute force logic with 7400 series stuff. I love it. And it keeps getting better. By loosening up these two screws, the top PCB rotates out of the way like the hood of a car, giving access to the lower PCB. Now to power this thing, I'm gonna need some power supplies, which means I gotta pilfer some from my TMS 9900 homebrew project. Don't worry, I have properly sized replacements for the homebrew, so these were always going to be removed and replaced. Next, let's pull the tray out and start getting things mocked up. And in order to do that, I gotta get this ATX power supply out of the way. This is what we were using for the TU-58, but the Fujitsu needs a lot more juice. And with the Fujitsu set in place, this is what I'm thinking for the layout of the power supplies. There are four power supplies in total. The Fujitsu needs plus 24 volts at six amps, plus five volts at four and a half amps, and a minus 12 volts at a whopping four amps. The TU-58 needs plus 12 volts at 1.2 amps and plus five volts at 0.75 amps. All of the meanwhile supplies I'm using are decently overrated for this application, so we shouldn't have any issues with current capability. And after hours of tedious wiring, this is the result. I wish I had a little more space to work with. This was a little too awkward to work around for my liking, but I got them all installed, got all the wires routed to the right places, and it's compact enough to fit on the tray alongside the Fujitsu and the TU-58. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves though, let's make sure the right voltages are in the right places. On the Fujitsu, the rails are all doubled up. So we see negative 12 volts and negative 12 volts, then plus five volts and plus five volts, and finally plus 24 volts and plus 24 volts. Then over on the Molex connector for the TU-58, we see plus five volts and plus 12 volts. That's all good. The last step before a first test is this little lever here. This unlocks the heads and spindle. All right, moment of truth. First proper spin up. Will it spin or will all of the tiny little uh, electrolytic surface mount capacitors explode? We, we don't know. Let's uh, flip the switch and find out. It is spinning. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> we, uh, we got a ready light. <laughs> Does that mean it's healthy? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> well, that was a resounding success. Let's push on with the build. Now, y'all are gonna see some footage of me putting the fans in and making some mounts for the drive, but while you watch that, I chatted with Coley about the drive. It's absolutely wild that this thing just powered up and went ready. We're still not sure what went wrong when Coley tested the drive, but for now, it seems the hard drive gods have finally decided to throw me a bone. Now you'll notice my fan is offset to the side and that's gonna be all right, but I still need a bit more cooling. So later on, I added this extra 120 volt AC fan here. This should keep all the drive power electronics cool. Next up, let's try to get this obscenely dense drive tray into place. Hopefully I can get all of it to fit, but I know the cabinet is going to need a little modification. So I set about tearing it down completely. And here is the problem. Once I slide the tray in, you can see the fan is hitting this cross support. To make matters worse, the Fujitsu is actually taller than the fan. That cross support is probably really important for structural integrity, but it's gotta go if this thing has a hope of fitting. Unfortunately, it's riveted into place. Fortunately, I have a drill. I filled the rivets with cutting oil, which makes a nice little smoke cloud when I'm drilling the rivets out. And there are two rivets per side for a total of four that needed to be drilled out. Then I just need to grab Thor's hammer here and give it a few good hits and it pops right out easy peasy. Now I took the chassis outside and cleaned it thoroughly before sliding the drive into place, but the drive tray slides right in. That's a good start. Let's get the big beast on top next. 
With the 1144 in place, you can see that I have just about a half inch, maybe a quarter inch of clearance. That's the most optimal usage of the space I had that I can think of. So let's take this thing for a test drive, shall we? I need to remove one of my grant continuity cards and install the Emulex SC12 card into the card cage. And then I remembered I should probably check the card's configuration. So I uninstalled the SC12 out of the card cage and set down with the SC12 manual. There are a boatload of dip switches on the card and I think most of them are correct. Speaking of which, this is what the Emulex card looks like up close. It's a pretty beautiful quad height Unibus card. All right, back into the card cage with this thing, and then let's hook up the ribbon cables. SMG drives use a 60 pin A cable for control signals and a 26 pin B cable for data signals. All right, first proper power up. The uh, Fujitsu is already spun up and has gone ready. Uh, so <laughs> we're just gonna flip the switch here. Uh, I have no idea if this Emulex card is good or bad, so hopefully nothing goes up in smoke here. And... Well, the Emulex card is flashing a fault light. That's not a great start, uh, but it didn't hold the bus. So the uh, CPU was able to boot. Looks like all of our voltages are good. And uh, the Fujitsu drive is still showing ready. So uh, that might mean that our Emulex card is unhealthy. Fortunately, I've got two of these Emulex SC12s. So uh, I'll just pull that one out and put the other one in and we'll see if it behaves in the exact same way. Uh, so it's plugged in now. Uh, let's flip the switch. I don't have the drive plugged into it right now, but... Yeah, sure enough, it's flashing the fault light as well. When in doubt, read the manual. Uh, and they have a nice little section here on the LED indicator. Uh, it says that um, the LED lamp is turned on as the controller starts its self-test and is turned off only when the controller successfully completes the test. So when this thing starts up, it's running some self-test diagnostic thing on there. Uh, and so the LED should go off telling us that it passed that diagnostic. However, uh, it says right here, the LED blinks at approximately a one second rate if the self-test is successful, but no drive is seen online. Uh, so that's what we were seeing. We were seeing that the LED was blinking at about one hertz, uh, so I, I think that means that it passed the self-test, but it didn't see our drive online. And I think I might've had it plugged into the wrong port. Uh, I was plugging into this one here, and I think this might be for uh, the B drive, and this one's gonna be for the A drive. So I think I need to swap that over and give it another try. All right, let's plug the cable into this plug here. Uh, and then keeping an eye on the LED here, let's flip the power switch on. Yeah. yeah. So the LED came on and then went off and is not flashing. I think that means that our Emulex controller card sees the Fujitsu drive as being online and ready. <laughs> that is awesome. All right, check this out. The manual says that the uh, status register for the hard drive is at E777440. And if I examine that, uh, it's totally empty, but this system is set up for full 22-bit addressing to go up to four megabytes. So I think I got to actually add a uh, one seven at the beginning of this and then seven, 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 four, four, zero. Uh, and then we'll examine that and we get zero, 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 two, zero, zero back. Uh, and <laughs> actually the manual says that is exactly what we should be seeing in that register, which is awesome. Means we're in great shape here. So what do these bits actually mean? Well, this is just an octal value representing 16 bits, and each bit means something different according to the manual. So uh, we'll start at the most significant bit, bit 15 all the way on the left here, and uh, work our way down. So bit 15 is zero, which means that there is no subsystem error. Bit 14 means that there hasn't been a drive initiated interrupt. Bit 13 means there's no parity error. Bit 12 means that we're set up for 22 sector format. Bit 11 means that we haven't timed out. Bit 10 indicates the drive type. Bits nine and eight set the bus address. Bit seven says that we are ready. And that's why we have this two lit up right here because bit seven is set, says the drive is good to go. Bit six is an interrupt enable. I don't fully understand whether that one's supposed to be on or off, but it's off, which I think is correct. I have no idea what bit five does. It doesn't clearly say in the manual. Bits four, three, two, and one are a function code. And then bit zero is the execute of that function code. 
Uh, but essentially what this is telling me is that the drive is online, the drive is ready, the card is healthy, we're ready to go if we had something bootable on that drive, which, which we don't. We're pretty sure it came out of a bag. <laughs> One last thing we can try is to actually try to boot the system. Uh, for example, if I do B space DD, this is gonna try and boot off of the TU-58. And uh, we can see that the drive initializes, it tries to find some data on the tape and there isn't any data to be had on that tape. So I gotta actually uh, reset the machine here because it, it hung on boot. But if we do a B space DM, this is gonna tell it to boot off of an RK06, which is what the Emulex card is emulating. Uh, and if I go ahead and hit enter on that, it says program and uh, it just hangs here. But the really exciting part is that if we look at the ready light on the hard drive, we can see that it's flickering. So the Emulex card is hitting the drive, trying to find any PDP-11 code to actually boot from. And since it's not finding any of that, it's just stuck in a perpetual loop, hitting the drive over and over again. But that means that it's trying to boot from this hard drive. And now we're in an interesting spot because I believe that we have a fully functional TU-58 and a fully functional Fujitsu 2312 in this machine. But every time we try to boot from either of those, nothing happens. And that's because they're filled with data that the PDP-11 can't read. All of the TU-58 tapes that I have came from a VAX and we're pretty sure that the Fujitsu drive came from a VAX as well. So whenever it sees some code on there, I'm sure that the formatting is similar enough, but it, there's absolutely nothing it can do with whatever it reads. So we need to get something on there that the PDP-11 can read. And here's where we're in a bit of a bind. The operating system that I have to run on this machine is RSX 11. Now I know that there's a ton of options for OSs on the PDP-11 and a lot of them are really fantastic, but it has to be RSX 11 because the uh, tiny amount of uh, software and routines and whatnot that we've found for the floating point systems FPS 100 and uh, FPS 3000 down here are all written in RSX 11. So we need that operating system on that hard drive so that we can boot into it and then get to work on our vector processor but how do I get RSX 11 onto that hard drive? We do have a TU-58 emulator, but as far as I know, there are not any RSX 11 related TU-58 install tapes out there at all. It would be really fantastic if I could just plug in the, the laptop to the TU-58 emulator port and just install RSX 11 that way, but I don't even think that's possible. And so now we need to come up with a different way to get RSX 11 installed onto that hard drive and we are well and truly out of my depth here. Uh, I do think it's time to give my buddy uh, Mark a call. He is an absolute wizard when it comes to RSX 11 and probably knows more about that operating system than nearly anyone alive today. And he may have some very vital insight, but also if you are familiar with RSX 11, leave a comment down below about what you think the best way to get that operating system onto this hard drive is. And uh, I'm gonna read all the comments. So I wanna thank you all so much for hanging out with me today. It was a very different episode than I was expecting because the hard, hardware just kind of worked and we were able to focus on getting things installed into the cabinet, which is super exciting. So thank you so much and I hope to see you in the next one.